politics, and current events. From the housetops, coming up next. The Liturgical Year by Abbot Garanger According to a tradition which has been handed down from the earliest ages of Christianity, it was at midday that Jesus ascended into heaven, the same hour at which he was raised up when nailed to the cross. Giving his blessed mother a look of filial affection and another of fond farewell to the rest of the group that stand around him, Jesus raises up his hands and blesses them all. While thus blessing them, he is raised up from the ground whereon he stands and ascends into heaven. Their eyes follow him until a cloud comes and receives him out of their sight. Yes, Jesus is gone. The earth has lost her Emmanuel. For four thousand years had he been expected. The patriarchs and prophets had desired his coming with all the fervor of their souls. He came. His love made him our captive in the chaste womb of the Virgin of Nazareth. It was there he first received our adorations. Nine months after, the Blessed Mother offered him to our joyous love in the stable at Bethlehem. We followed him into Egypt. We returned with him. We dwelt with him at Nazareth. When he began the three years of his public life, we kept close to his steps. We delighted in being near him. We listened to his preaching and parables. We saw his miracles. The malice of his enemies reached its height, and the time came wherein he was to give us the last and greatest proof of the love which brought him down from heaven by dying for us on a cross. We kept near him as he died, and our souls were purified by the love that flowed from his wounds. On the third day he rose again from the grave, and we stood by exulting in his triumph over death, for that triumph won for us a like resurrection. During the forty days he spent with us since his resurrection, our faith has made us cling to him. We would have kept him with us forever, but the hour is come. He has left us. Yes, our dearest Jesus is gone. O oh, happy the souls that he had taken from limbo. They have gone with him, and for all eternity are to enjoy the heaven of his visible presence. The disciples are still steadfastly looking up towards heaven, when, lo, two angels clad in white appear to them, saying, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye looking up to heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come as you have seen him going into heaven. He has ascended a Savior. He is to return a judge. Between these two events is comprised the whole life of the church on earth. We are therefore living under the reign of Jesus as our Savior, for he has said to us, God sent not his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved by him. And to carry out this merciful design, he has just been giving to his disciples the mission to go throughout the whole world and invite men, while yet there is time, to accept the mystery of salvation. What a task is this he imposes on the apostles, and now that they are to begin their work, he leaves them. They return from Mount Olivet, and Jesus is not with them. And yet they are not sad. They have Mary to console them. Her unselfish generosity is their model, and well do they learn the lesson. They love Jesus. They rejoice at the thought of his having entered into his rest. They went back into Jerusalem with great joy. These few simple words of the gospel indicate the spirit of this admirable feast of the Ascension. It is a festival which, notwithstanding its soft tinge of sadness, is more than any other expressive of joy and triumph. From the Housetops Radio features the same Catholic doctrine, spirituality, church history, and apologetics published for over 40 years in From the Housetops magazine. This program, dedicated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, promotes her cause in the age-old conflict with the powers of darkness. From the Housetops on WQPH 89.3 FM. For many years, the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary have received correspondence from prisoners. Inmates from around the country have contacted us requesting books, rosaries, medals, Bibles, and our From the Housetops publications. Evidently, there are advantages to being in confinement if good reading, reflection, and prayer become part of a prisoner's life. From our correspondence with inmates, it's very clear. Amazingly enough, many of the most unlikely candidates for conversion are found in prison cells. This was certainly the case of a prisoner who recently shared his story with us. 
to protect his identity, we'll call him Joe, Joe was a 50-year-old man in a state penitentiary doing life for murder. He wrote, quote, My life had gotten to the point I had had enough. In a cell locked down, I planned to end my life one night. By divine action, I understand now, I bumped into my cell personal property locker and knocked to the floor a packet containing Catholic materials an inmate had given me just that day before I went to lockdown. When the packet hit the floor, an article about suicide and how it was wrong to take your own life was staring me right in the eyes. I read it and picked up the picture of Mary that had also fallen from the packet, and as I wept, a feeling of such calm and peace came over me as I had never felt before. Not long after this, Joe contacted us, and we sent him a Douay Reims Bible and a Penny Catechism and other literature. He is convinced beyond all doubt that God is real and that, quote, the Catholic faith is the only true religion, end quote. He intends to study and to be received into the church very soon. <laughs> The voice of the elderly priest praying in Italian is the voice of a saint, Padre Pio. What is most striking about the life of Padre Pio? He is a modern miracle worker, a saint who could biolocate, a mystic who could read souls, see the past and look into the future. Above all these, we recognize a frail man of suffering who bore the very wounds of Christ, the stigmata. These wounds were not, as he said, just decorations. They bled and caused him excruciating pain for all of fifty years. Padre Pio prayed all the time to suffer. He wanted to be like our Lord on the cross, interceding for the salvation of souls. Besides the stigmata, he had trials of misunderstandings, humiliations, and persecution from authorities within the Church. He bore all trials patiently, offering them up in union with Christ. The fruits of these sufferings were abundant. By nature, we all avoid suffering as much as possible. We see no use for it. As society becomes more decadent and men more effeminate, the slightest pains, difficulties, and contradictions appear worthless and must be eliminated. Society sees no value in the lifelong struggle of the imperfect child. The sufferings of the old are deemed worthless. Euthanasia is advocated, and even among the healthy, suicide is on the rise. The saints, however, see the value of suffering. Countless men and women gladly gave their life out of love for Christ and received the martyr's crown. St. Peter said, If you partake of the sufferings of Christ, rejoice that when his glory shall be revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. 1 Peter 4.13 St. Paul loved to recount the many sufferings he underwent in his apostolic journeys, his many labors, imprisonments, beatings, stripes above measure, in deaths often, shipwrecks, stoning, hunger and thirst, and perils from Gentiles and from false brethren. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, he says to the Colossians, and fill up those things that are wanting of the sufferings of Christ in my flesh, for his body, which is the church. To the saints, suffering is like gold, a valuable medium of exchange. In the temporal sphere, many are willing to undergo sufferings in exchange for something highly prized. Look at any field of sports and take, for instance, the marathon. In the race and everything leading up to it, are there not long hours of grueling agony? Those who succeed in everyday life are willing to accept the toils and labors related to business, a job, education, or family life. There is suffering wherever we look. In any worthwhile endeavor, success only comes at the price of some sort of suffering. In the spiritual realm, suffering produces its greatest results. Our redemption was purchased at the great price of our Lord's sufferings and death on the cross. This was the culmination of the life of Christ and it alone is remembered every day in the offering of Mass, the reenactment of Calvary. May we see the value of the sufferings that come our way and pray for the grace to offer them in union with Christ for the love of souls. May Padre Pio give us the example of acceptance of Christ-like suffering. 
Immaculate Heart of Mary School was started in 1976 in response to the needs of families who identified a crisis in Catholic education. To the present day, the brothers and sisters of the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary continue their educational mission. I moved from Chicago two years ago. Before we moved, I was interviewing for jobs around the country, and each time I had an interview, I would look at the map of Latin masses around the nation and try to find where there were centers for the Latin mass near the city that I was interviewing in. I had an interview in Worcester, that was one of the interviews, and uh, I found St. Benedict Center with the uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary School attached, associated with that particular place. Uh, obviously, first of all, just being a private and religious school, the children learn theology, they learn the faith, they learn the things that they will not learn in the public school system. But of course, many Catholic schools can offer that. IHM, though, offers also classes that are taught by religious, that live the life that they teach about, and also partly, I guess, in fact, primarily because it's run by religious, the cost is quite low for the school that makes it accessible for larger families. And then, of course, there's just an entire community surrounding the school that includes the religious and the, the parents and all of the children. It's very welcoming to everyone. And ultimately, when it came down to it, I had several job offers. Uh, and the deciding factor in my selecting the job offer from Worcester was the Immaculate Heart of Mary School. For more information, contact ImmaculateHeartSchool.org. Hello, friends. This is Father Wade Menezes with the Fathers of Mercy and EWTN. And I want to thank you for listening to Queen of Perpetual Help Radio, WQPH 89.3 FM. Well, Marianne, our good friend Peter and Jimmy has started a new project. Maybe you could tell our listeners about it. So it's in the planning stage. You might want to help Peter plan how he's going to execute. He's having a calendar for the Holy Souls in Purgatory. So each day of the month, it will have a mass intention or a prayer intention for someone that's deceased. We did have a very big loss in our community with the loss last week of Deacon Kucha, who is uh, very active in the Fitchburg area, 61 years married to Ruth Ann, and did a tremendous amount of work. So, for example, he could be remembered on these calendars and other people as well. And then also, Peter's very wound up, and he should be, about gaining plenary indulgences for yourself and to release holy souls in purgatory. Heaven only knows how many of my ancestors are still in purgatory that I never think to pray for. Friends that died, oh, they're so holy, they have gone straight to heaven. No, most of us drop by the grill for a while, right? That's right. So let's say a prayer to the holy souls, Connie, and pray for Peter, and he will be talking more on his Your Prayer Intention program, which we air on Saturdays following 13th Apostle at 12 noon to 1230, Your Prayer Intentions. Tune in and let Peter tell you how he's going to do this. So we'll say eternal rest. Grant unto them, O Lord, and may perpetual light shine upon them. May the souls and the souls of all the faithful departed, rest in peace. Amen. And our condolences to you, Mrs. Kucha, on the loss of your husband, the deacon, married 61 years. What a testimony that is to everybody. God bless you and your family, and may he rest in peace. Amen. Hello, this is Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life. As reported by the Centers for Disease Control and various states, sometimes a child survives an abortion procedure. The law, while recognizing these born children as persons, still does not provide adequate protection for them. Congressional Republicans have introduced a bill to strengthen such protection. It is the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. The Democrats oppose it. They don't even want to discuss it. People find it hard to believe that babies born alive aren't already being adequately protected, but they are killed or left alone to die. This bill would not affect whether or when someone can have an abortion, but rather focuses on babies born alive. Learn more and spread the word at bornalive.us. This is Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life.
When Our Lady appeared to the children of Fatima, one of the things she said to them every time she appeared is, I want you to come here on the 13th of each month. So I like to promote our candlelight processions at the Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in Brighton on the 13th of each month from May through October at 8 p.m. We have Father Ed Riley who's coming, who's a chaplain of the World Apostolate of Fatima and a regular at the Shrine. So please join us, 8 p.m. 155 Washington Street, Brighton. You are listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg. And now a word from author Peter and Jimmy, who is the host of Your Prayer Intentions, taking place every Saturday at 12.30 p.m. Whether you're donating money or giving us prayers, without you, we don't go on. And if you do want to help us go on, please consider going to wqphradio.org. There's a donate button there. You can give once, you can give monthly, and it makes a difference. It keeps all of our shows, and we have a great lineup of shows keeps us going and whether you're a fan of uh, your prayer intentions or whether you like dr rollo on do no harm which is on sundays at 11 a.m and p.m whether you like steve's show benedict's hammer sundays at midnight whether you like brother matthew and brother anthony from from the housetops which is on sundays 10 30 a.m and 4 p.m whether you're a fan of the children's rosary which we have every day at 5 p.m seven days a week whether you like our local matter show, which is Saturday at 11, or Talk Catholic, which comes right after us at 12.30, or Dan and Tom with the 13th Apostle, which comes just before us at 11.30, any of those shows and all the stuff you, you donate, you help these things come out. But what also at the WQPH website, in addition to podcasts of our shows, is the prayer wall. Right on the prayer wall, support WQPH and get WQPH 24 hours a day, seven days a week on WQPHradio.org. Our Quest for Happiness One of the most important effects of confirmation is inward grace. The divine life conferred in baptism by the infusion of sanctifying grace is given more abundantly in the sacrament of confirmation. There is a fuller outpouring of grace conferred by the Holy Spirit. This grace has for its special effects the strengthening of the soul and the faith received in baptism. Confirmation has been called the school of the Holy Spirit. It is here that athletes for God are trained and formed. Weak, timid, trembling souls the apostles were, but our Lord promised them, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the very ends of the earth. Acts chapter 1 How well were the words of our Lord verified! This abiding strength against external temptation will be ours too, if realizing our own natural weakness, we trust in the supernatural strength given by grace. For confirmation guarantees that provided we are of good will, God is faithful and will not permit you to be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also give you a way out that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 In baptism we are made temples of the Holy Ghost But in confirmation, he takes possession of the soul in a new and more complete manner. As a means of comparison, we may say the difference between a baptized and a confirmed soul is like the difference between a blessed and a consecrated church. The former, a blessed church, is dedicated to the worship of God, but there is no guarantee that it will always be so. The latter, a consecrated church, is set aside completely by solemn consecration as the place for the holy sacrifice of the Mass and of the Blessed Sacrament. Never may a consecrated church, while it remains intact, be used for any other purpose. So too the soul of a confirmed Christian should serve as a consecrated temple for the Holy Spirit. The Manual for Total Consecration to Mary This book contains the readings and prayers for St. Louis de Montfort's 33 days of preparation for consecrating oneself to Jesus through Mary. This manual includes complete texts from Holy Scripture, The Imitation of Christ, Montfort's writings and prayers used for total consecration, all in this one handy volume. The slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary of St. Benedict Center are pleased to make this manual available for those committing themselves to Mary for the first time, or for those who wish to renew their consecration previously made. Available exclusively from St. Benedict Center. 
go to stbenedict.com gift shop and order your copy of the Manual for the Total Consecration to Mary. Hammond's Meditations Let us transport ourselves in spirit to the cynical and unite our meditation with that of Mary and the apostles assembled together there, awaiting the coming of the Holy Spirit. Let us beg of our Lord to make us thoroughly understand the advantages of interior solitude and to give us the love and the practice of it. Interior solitude glorifies God. The soul which has the courage to be isolated within itself from all that is not God, that it may be given up wholly to God alone, thereby tells him that he alone is all, that everything else is nothing, that the world and all the creatures in it do not deserve a thought of the mind or an affection of its heart, that to God alone it belongs and will always belong, that he only is sufficient to it, because he alone is all good. Now, is there any homage more worthy of the divine majesty? Interior solitude sanctifies us. The whole of Christian life, the whole of Christian perfection, reduces itself to these two points, to separate ourselves from creatures and to unite ourselves to God. Now both the one and the other are admirably accomplished in the interior solitude. There we learn to separate ourselves from the world and from ourselves from the world, because we clearly see the nothingness and the folly of it, from ourselves, because our eyes, being always kept open and beholding our own heart, we see all its miseries. Oh, how all creatures seem but as nothing when we consider them in the interior solitude, and how willingly, then, does the heart detach itself from them. But at the same time, how truly God appears as He really is, that is to say, as the great All, the One alone amiable, the one alone perfect. Listen, O my soul, listen in the bottom of thy heart, not in that part where the imagination creates its distractions, but in that deeper portion where truth makes itself to be heard, where pure and simple ideas collect together, and there in the secret of thy heart will noiselessly resound those divine words, God alone is all, God alone is just. All which is not God is nothing. At these words, overwhelmed by the beauties of this supreme being, you will take to him all your love, and immediately you will find him approaching towards you with incomparable goodness. According to the words of the Apostle, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. James 4, eight. Thus, in the interior solitude is consummated the divine union. The soul cries out then with the spouse of the canticles, I found him whom my soul loveth, I held him and will not let him go. Canticles 3 4. I will keep him in the solitude of my heart. I will remain there alone with him, alone without any other desire than that of his presence, alone without any other love than his alone, without any other will than his good pleasure. Oh, what rapid progress do we then make in virtue! We find nothing difficult because we have the strong God within us, nothing painful because we have with us the God of all consolation. We are no longer tempted to pause or delay in our spiritual advancement because it is God Himself who bears us along. We are no longer tempted to be attached to creatures because this union, contracted in the shadow of the internal solitude, consumes the soul with charity and makes it in a manner divine even in this life. Interior solitude forms our happiness. The interior solitude is where we love God, we enjoy his presence, and the soul, rendered happy and tranquil, exclaims like the apostles upon Mount Tabor, It is good to be here. There we lead a hidden life, but it is hidden in God and in the society of Jesus Christ. What more do we want in order to be happy? There we converse delightfully with God, and in comparison with a word uttered by God, what are all the speeches of men? There things belonging to the world do not enter, but things belonging to heaven descend into it every day. Every day God reveals to the soul beauties unperceived until then. There the vain joys of the world are put aside, but Jesus Christ compensates for them by the unction of his consolations and the abundance of his peace. Oh, what do we not gain by this exchange even as regards pleasure and happiness? O solitude, says St. Jerome, paradise on earth, road to heaven. O desert, where we enjoy familiarity with God. 
O Christian soul, thou art greater than the world. There, lastly, is the tabernacle, where the faithful soul hides itself as in the face of God, far from the tumult of men and the contradiction of tongues, the strong tower where reigns a continual calm. And it is there that it is good to dwell from the rising to the setting of the sun. It is there that it is good to work and to repose, to pray and to converse, finally, to do all things. How are we in regard to this interior solitude? Have we formed it in ourselves, and do we maintain it by the practice of recollection? The mother of God begged the children of Fatima to pray, pray a great deal and make sacrifices for sinners. For many souls go to hell because they have no one to sacrifice and pray for them. There is abundant grace in the Fatima prayers that we should all know and love to recite. Before Our Lady appeared at Fatima, an angel taught the children to pray, My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I beg pardon of you for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. They also learned to pray, O Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore you profoundly and offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the earth, in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifferences with which he himself is offended, and through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and of the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg of you the conversion of poor sinners. At Our Lady's first appearance, the children were inspired to pray, Most Holy Trinity, I adore you, my God, my God, I love you in the most blessed sacrament. Our Lady told the children, Sacrifice yourselves for sinners. Say many times when offering some sacrifice, O Jesus, it is for your love, for the conversion of sinners, and in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And of course, the familiar prayer said after each mystery of the rosary, O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. From the House Stops is produced by the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.